Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Higher Education Tableau User Group July 11th, 2023 meeting. We're delighted to have you with us today, even if you are sweltering in the sun in Phoenix <laughs> or Florida or South Carolina or Texas. I know it's hot everywhere. All right. So today we're going to have announcements. I'll open the floor in just a minute for those, followed by meet a community member. And instead of having one person we are going to get to know all of you today with a little bit of a Kahoot um, survey poll. Then we're going to hear from Andrew Drinkwater. He's going to talk about noodling around with dysfunctional relationships. And then Christy Simpson is going to share how to engage and interact with her online uh, Tableau fact book. And then we'll have wrap up and chat at the end like we always do. So before I open the floor to announcements, I just want to tell everyone that we have added all of the rest of the TUG meetings for this year to our Bevy events page. I think Roshi just put the link in the chat. That means you can go ahead and sign up for all the meetings for the rest of the year so you don't have to worry about it from month to month. And uh, we'll, we'll not have all the details for all of them up yet, but we'll add those like each month as we get that set up. So. Go ahead and take care of that if you would like. And now I'll open the floor to others who might have announcements, any job announcements or open positions. Feel free to come off mute or put something in the chat box. I don't know if Lisa's here. Lisa oh, Trescott, first you said you might have an There you are. Finished chewing. <laughs> no coffee. problem. Um, I will just announce that there is a brand new tug for the California Community Colleges. We just had our first planning meeting this morning, so I don't have an, a bevy page or any details, but just at FYI, it's coming. And it is the California Community Colleges tug, but it is open to anyone uh, who would like to join, whether you're in higher ed or in a community college or in the California community college system. So we would love to have you. That's awesome, Lisa. Is that gonna be uh, mostly online or hybrid or mostly? Yes, hybrid? it will probably be solely virtual just because we have colleges all throughout um, California. So to make sure everyone is able to attend will be a virtual tug. Exciting, that's great. If you have, um, let's see, I guess you can put links up in the Slack group as those become available. Yes, yes, awesome. I will do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other announcements from anyone? All right. I guess we will just get started. Roshni, take it away. So back two years ago, maybe to the well maybe a few days after today um we did a review of our slack space to see you know who who is the he tug like what is the higher ed tableau user group community like and we had almost 2,000 users from almost 500 institutions two years ago um we've added one time zone just one <laughs> about 150 institutions and over a thousand new users over the last couple of years um which is just a, you know it's a great sign that this community is is growing that there's a lot more people using tableau and we hope that the higher ed tableau user group he tug is helping all of you guys um with whatever you're doing in your organization um so this, we just wanted to let's sort of highlight some numbers because, you know, we're supposed to be about data and things. Um, but the other thing that we did back at our first tug meeting um, was we played a little Kahoot to learn a little bit more about how, you know, people were using Tableau. And so we want to, to open that up again um, and do another Kahoot. So if you go to uh, either on your phone or on your computer, um, if you go to, to the Kahoot website or just take take a picture of uh, the QR code um, with your phone. Sorry, I'm trying to type and uh, <laughs> and speak at the same time. It never works. Um, so if you go to that website that I just put in the chat, which apparently does not want to show up, I don't know why, does not want to show up as a link. Um, a whole bunch of you guys are getting in there. Let's see how many users we get today uh, in our in our chat. We've got 126 people in the meeting. So let's see uh, how many of, of you all join 
our uh, our Kahoot. Um, so last time around, you know, we asked, I think it was about a dozen questions um, about various Tableau and Tableau user group things. Um, this time around, this is our 25th meeting, our silver anniversary of sorts. Um, so we're going to have 25 questions. Um, some of them are going to be fun. Some of them are going to be nerdy. A lot of them are going to be nerdy because, you know, that's how we roll. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to close this QR code. It's still going to show up on your screen. If you're if you're typing manually, just go to um, kahoot.it and type in the pin number 743 pin number. It's a pin. There's no number there. That's part of the end. Um, the pin is 743-7829. Wow, we're at, a, at almost 100 people in this Kahoot of the 129 people in the meeting. So this is actually pretty, uh, pretty good numbers. I know, Andrew, an ATM machine, that's not real either. It's an ATM. Let's talk about redundancies here. All right. Looks like the numbers are setting out. Um, let me go ahead and copy this link and throw it in the chat for anyone else who... Uh... Oh, nice, nice. I, I like how we're nerding out with NPS scores. The S, I assume, stands for scores. Um, all right, if we hit 100 or in 30 seconds, I'm gonna go ahead and open up this Kahoot. I feel very much like a game show host. Oh yeah, Tug Group. A whole bunch of people say Tug Group. Ooh, Office of the Redundancy Office, even better. All right, why are people leaving? I don't understand why people are leaving. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and start this thing. Press the start button. So if you haven't played a Kahoot before, don't worry. It's not that hard. Um, we're going to read you a question. There may or may not be multiple options. Um, no one, there's no scoring here, um, but you just want to answer with whatever you think is the right answer or the best answer. So in our very first meeting, our very first Kahoot question was, what's the coolest Tableau user group or Tableau user group tug or tug group or some such thing? We've got the Atlanta Tableau user group the higher ed Tableau user group, you know that's the right answer, the South Lancaster undergraduate Tableau user group or slug tug, or the Portland University graduate Tableau user group or pug tug. So 95% of you did reply AT tug, which you know is the right answer. Um, but slug tug and pug tug, those were two of our, our favorite potential user group names. So if anyone is at Portland University, I don't even know if there is a Portland University, or a South Lancaster group, um, please use these names. We want to see them in real life. Um, and a random fact about the Atlanta Tableau user group, that was actually the first Tableau user group um, ever, I believe, or at least so I've heard. Um, so next question. In our early days, in these lightning rounds, this is our epic lightning round, we'd ask such nerdy data things as, do you prefer line charts or bar charts? So what do you prefer? Ooh, two thirds of us prefer bar charts over line charts. Ooh, hold on, I'm gonna go back. Oh, I can't go back. There's a whole media thing. We'd also sometimes get salty or sweet and ask donut charts or pie charts. Um, just so you know, the screenshot, I, I, I took a picture of a book. I don't often do that, but I had to for this one. Um, and most folks prefer donut charts to pie charts. I'm a little surprised, but I mean, I get it. Donuts are better. I'm just gonna ooh, show the media here. Um, I'm not a fan of donut charts. You may have found this out or pie charts actually, um, but Stephen Few has some tasty words about this. If pie charts are graphical pastries filled with empty calories, donut charts are the same and more. Ah, such snark. Uh, next question. We sometimes get tableau nerdy by asking, which do you prefer more, sets or parameters? So the image in the background here is from Heidi Kalba's uh, website, Queen of Data, um, where she talks about set actions and parameter actions. She actually has a four part blog series um, and all of these links, we're gonna throw them into our Slack space. Um, unfortunately, copying and pasting and pressing buttons too much, too much to do at once. 
Um, but this image came from her blog post uh, or a series of blog posts about how the two differ. Um, it has a bunch of examples too. So apparently we're a, we're a parameter group. Um, so yeah. We sometimes had some fun questions in our early days, like vampires versus werewolves. Um, and back in the days of Twilight, people actually paid attention to things like name popularity of Twilight characters. We like our vampires over our werewolves. I have noticed when I was looking for, for images here, um, I did uh, I, I did notice that there's a whole lot more uh, Tableau public visits on vampires than there are on werewolves. I don't know why that is, but fun fact. All right. Well, as some of you have caught on, that also led to the Twilight-inspired Team Tiled or Team Floating. I know what I am. Team Tiled. Um, but I'm curious to see whether we're a tiled group or a floating group. Ooh, Team Tiled. Good choices, folks. <laughs> I'm so judgmental. All right. Tableau's order of operations. It's a fascinating subject. So which do you use more? LODs, level of detail expressions, or table calculations, or Tableau has an order of operations, what? So level of detail uh, expressions include things like fixed, include, and exclude, table calcs like index and rank. And then, yeah, if, you, if you've never heard of the Tableau order of operations, Google it. And again, we will be putting some links in the Slack uh, space. Ooh, this is an almost an even match. I'm kind of surprised about this. So LODs, a little bit more popular than table calcs. I get that. Table calcs are hard. Um, and then a lot of folks don't know about table order of operations. Hmm. If anyone has any thoughts uh, or a presentation about order of operations, we'd love to hear about it. Um, if you go to tinyurl.present at HETUG, uh, we would love to hear what you want to share about them. Then, before I pass it on to Andrew, there's a lot to be said about the power of one. So what's your go-to calculation with one? Min, max, average, sum, or attribute? And what you'll notice in the, in the, uh, the screenshot here, uh, which comes from the Designing Efficient Production Workbooks white paper, or just Designing Efficient Workbooks, if you Google that on the Tableau site, um, wow, that's an even split. I was not expecting that. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna, let me pop over this, this image again. Um, so min and max are uh, calculations that you often won't think about, um, but they are faster and more uh, performant. Um, one of my favorite words. Thanks, Andrew, for throwing that uh, URL in there. Um, so min and max are a little bit more performant uh, than average or attribute. And part of the reason for that is with um, with attribute, for example, Tableau actually looks to look to see if the min and the max are the same. So it's already doing both the min and max calculations um, to figure out the attribute. So min and max, much better than attribute and average. All right, Andrew, do are you ready for the next one? I am ready. This one is, are you a fan of the show me pane or do you prefer to build your charts yourself or DIY? Oh, close one, but DIY wins the day. How many worksheets do you generally put on a dashboard? Up to 10, 10 to 20, more than 20? Or don't you shame me? Less than 10, awesome. I was always taught less than five is a good rule of thumb, but you can use a worksheet for a lot of things that aren't particularly visible. So what do bands mean to you? What is that acronym for? Is it big amazing numbers, big aggregate numbers, big ass numbers, or Bachelor of Arts in Nursing? OK. 
okay, pretty clear for that one. I love that, that we all, most of us chose the right answer. I'm also proud of the two people that picked Bachelor of Arts in Nursing. So where do you prepare your data? In Tableau Prep, in a tool like Excel, inside the database, such as with SQL, uh, or using a different ETL tool like Alteryx, FME, Informatica, and tons of others? Or you have to prep data before you visualize it? Lots of people using the database for pretty advanced stuff. That's great. How do you like your dates? Discrete, continuous, discrete, or we were on a break? You've got to add some emphasis to that. We were on a break. And what is your favorite mark type? Bar, line, or area, or old school? Uh, I like shapes, squares, circles, custom shapes. Tables are terrific. Text is the way to go. Polygons are where it's at. I keep falling for density. I keep waffling. Wait, I got it. Pie or donut charts? Mm. Well, that's pretty clear. Old school wins the day and uh, shape charts appear to be gaining some momentum. So when it comes to documentation, do you pr provide comments for your calculations? Always, sometimes, never have I ever, or what's commenting? Is that kind of like a retweet? sometimes is the most common, like a feeling we all know well, I'm sure. There's a lot of community database challenges out there. What are your favorites? Makeover Monday, Workout Wednesday, Prep and Data, Edge of Visitors, others, or this is the first time I've heard of these. Okay, so um, I've never heard of any of these was the most popular. So some great community challenges out there if you're looking to level up your Tableau skills, build your profile and not expose your confidential data. Uh, how do you integrate R, Python, MATLAB or no thank you? We debated a follow up question for whether IT dictated the answer to this question or not, but we jettisoned that. Uh, Ginny, I'll turn it over to you for next round. All righty. So we started off last month's meeting with a music pumping Madonna's Vogue. What is your favorite couplet from that song? All you need is your own imagination, so use it, that's what it's for. Or beauty's where you find it, not just where you bump and grind it. Or don't just stand there, let's get to it. Strike a pose, there's nothing to it. Or last, you're a superstar. That's what you are. You know it. Nice data viz that you picked for that one, Roshni. <laughs> All right, so don't just stand there. Let's get to it. Strike a pose. There's nothing to it. It's our winner. Next up, uh, today is the date of the famous duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. What do you prefer or who? Who do you prefer? <laughs> you guys remember the commercial, the Got Milk commercial? 
I don't know, but I see that most of us prefer Alexander Hamilton, and um, I don't know how much the musical might have had an effect on that answer. <laughs> All right, so today is also 7-Eleven day. What is your favorite 7-Eleven beverage innovation? The Big Gulp or the Slurpee? Ah, the Slurpee is the winner. I'm not sure I've ever had one, to be honest. All right, so it is also National Swimming Pool Day. Do you prefer chlorine pool, a saltwater pool, or ew, just ew? <laughs> I see at least four of you agree with Roshni on that one, and the rest of you are kind of 50-50. Uh, July 9th through the 15th is Sports Cliché Week. So which sports cliche can you not live without? There is no I in team. The best defense is a good offense. It was a slam dunk. Keep your eye on the ball. The ball's in your court or they're in a league of their own. There's no crying in baseball. I like that. Wow, that one is pretty much spread evenly across the board, except for the slam dunk. <laughs> July 15th through 19th is National Scrabble Week. So what is your favorite tile word game? Scrabble, Wordle, Bananagrams, or Boggle? How many of those in the bowl? We had to look up bananagrams. I, for one, did not know what that was. And the winner is Scrabble. I wonder if uh, the image had something to do with that. Just maybe we were priming the pump a little bit with those uh, Scrabble points. That might have been. Uh, Wimbledon is happening right now, July 3rd through 16th. Who is the greatest Wimbledon player? Roger Federer, Serena Williams, Martina. Oh, gosh, you had to make me pronounce that. Navratilova. Navratilova, thank you. Uh, Ray, Ray Rafael Nadal, uh, Pete Sampras, or Steffi Graf. Can you tell I don't watch tennis? Hey, Serena Williams has it. I did know that one. Final question. Tableau introduced relationships as an alternative to joins back in 2020. Which do you prefer? I love noodling around with relationships or joins all the way, inner, left, right, or full outer. I use them, use them all, and I enjoy them. Enjoy. <laughs> Oh boy, joins are still the number one preferred, at least in our group. But that's okay, because uh, that will allow Andrew to try and bring you over to the dark side. So before, I, before we get back to the presentation, Ginny, you had a question about one of the answers, and I don't remember which one that was. So we're gonna... I, I wanted to see how many people said we were on a break. <laughs> <laughs> ah, especially because I was watching Friends last night. Um, Only three. We tried so hard with that one. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right. fun. Thank you, everyone, for playing our epic lightning round for participating. Um, and uh, we're glad that you know you played along. Hope you had fun. Um, if you want to actually be spotlighted and tell us a little bit about yourself at a future HE Tug meeting, um, please let us know. Uh, the link I've already forgotten. I think it's tinyurl.com slash present at HE Tug. Um, we will post it in the, in the, uh, the chat shortly. Um, 
But next, uh, we're going to actually learn a little bit more about relationships, um, dysfunctional relationships, in fact, uh, from Andrew Drinkwater. So Andrew is the president and co-founder of Plaid Analytics. They recently announced uh, or launched Plaid Forecast, a mobile-friendly, easy-to-use enrollment forecasting platform. Um, so before working at Plaid or founding Plaid, um, Andrew worked at UBC and at Simon Fraser uh, University in Vancouver, BC, uh, working his way up from an academic advisor and recruiter to a senior planning and research analyst. He holds an MBA and a graduate certificate in visual analytics and enjoys mentoring students and institutional research professionals. Um, he began using Tableau in 2007. I don't know what version that was, but I'm assuming it was in the single digits. Um, <laughs> after dashboards, but before maps, um, and has helped institutions across North America build and scale their Tableau usage. He's also on the board of the of SERPA, uh, the Canadian Institutional Research and Planning Association. And of course, he's one of our HE Tug co-leads. Um, so Andrew, please take it away and share with us what you've learned about dysfunctional relationships in Tableau. All right. Thank you very much for the kind intro, Roshni. Um, and thanks, everybody, for having me. So today I'm going to do tips and tricks, and we're going to have a look at some of the challenges that occasionally come up in relationships in Tableau. My apologies, this was the moment that Zoom made all the windows cover my presentation. Okay, so dysfunctional relationships in Tableau, when noodles let you down, is the presentation today. I'm Andrew. Um, Roshni already introduced me and did a better job of it than I would live. Um, so feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and this QR code will show up again at the end uh, if you want to chat more. Okay, so I've presented on relationships before and run some risk of becoming the relationship guy for this group. Um, but as a quick um, summary of them, they are a flexible way to combine data from multiple tables using Tableau. The, to me, some of the big advantages of these are that they keep the original level of detail and domain for each table. So you can use tables independently or together as appropriate. Um, and you don't lose information and you don't have the same kinds of challenges typically with uh, duplication and loss of data as you would with joints. The fields that you use in your viz determine what query and joins are run for that particular visualization and it's run in real time. Um, extracts change that calculus a tiny bit, but the basic idea is the same, that it runs a query to your base tables uh, each time that it runs. Um, to me, the reason why this matters is that it allows you to have a single Tableau data source that can answer multiple kinds of questions. And we'll get into an example or two of that here. Okay, so today we are using um, an very fake data. So this is from Plaid University, which is an invented university designed for demonstrations like this one. Um, so anything that you do see has been generated by code. So you can share it on the internet if you want. And there's no FERPA or FIPA or et cetera, uh, privacy rules that are going to impact it because it's all made up. Um, so there's four primary data sources that you'll see today, three of which we're actually going to use. Um, there's a student term data source, which has one row per student per term that they're active. And in this context for our fake university, active means they're able to register. It doesn't necessarily mean that they did register. There's a courses data set, which is one row per course per term that it was offered. A course section, same idea, but at the section level and course enrollment. So course enrollment is the list of students enrolled in each of the courses offered in that term. So we kind of go from pretty high level for the two data sources on the left to more granular as we move towards the right. So why would we even want to relate these in Tableau? Well. The advantage of this is that we can get accurate totals at all levels of the hierarchy without any hacking. So as an example, we can use a data source that relates these four blocks together, and we can get an accurate headcount for the term out of student term, and we can get an accurate picture of who enrolled in Accounting 101 in the course enrollment part of it, but all from the same Tableau data source. This works really well, except when things get a little bit dysfunctional, which is what they're really sorry, which is what the presentation is about today, but maybe our relationships about that too. Okay, uh, we also use the NCS undergraduate enrollment by race, ethnicity and non-resident status data that's linked here. Uh, that was just so that we could assign ethnicities to our fake students. Um, so you'll see that kind of trickle through in the examples that, that follow. 
So the first example is when the totals don't match our expectations. Um, so in this example, we have criminology 421, and we've got our chart broken down by race and ethnicity. And what we can see here is that all the totals look pretty similar. Uh, but in particular, the last row, so race and ethnicity is white row, has 110 instead of 107. You may also have known that the total is listed as 110. When this happens in Tableau, my spidey senses start tingling. Something looks weird. One is probably we don't have equal enrollment for all of these race and ethnicity groups. The other is why is one group a little bit higher than the others? And if I was swimming through dozens or hundreds of courses, I might not have even noticed that this was an issue, which is how it came up in the first place. And I'm also a bit suspicious about why one group matches the total that's listed, but not the others. So let's move over to Tableau and take a look at what's going on here. All right, so we're gonna attempt to do this live together, um, but I do have a backup if that all crashes and burns. Okay, so the first thing we did was we took our Excel file that has all four of these tables in it, we dragged it onto Tableau for a quick connection. This works slightly differently if we had a database connection, which is what this is mimicking, but this Excel is a quick alternative here. So we're gonna start with connecting to the table that we think has the most records in it that are relevant, but is the smallest table. So in this case, I'm gonna say student term because it has a list of every one of the students we should want to include. You can connect these in any order, but um, my bias from being a grizzled database veteran is to start with kind of the key audience and the smallest table size and work my way out from there. Next, we're going to add course section to our data source by dragging it on the canvas. This will take a second because it's a little bit bigger. or longer than it did when I demoed this as a practice run. Okay. I don't know what happened there. Uh, hang on one second, I'll switch to plan B. Okay, so this uh, is roughly the problem that we saw in the slides, although I think I had picked criminology instead of Kent. So this is the example we were looking at in the slides. And so how this kind of begins is we had a registered total students of 110 in criminology 421. And so this came from our course section data source that had information on registrants. And remember that course section was row, one row per section that was offered. So this is still aggregated above what is in the data source itself, but it's a simple sum of one through five sections worth for this course. So we see 110. The next thing that happened is we said, well, how do we break that 110 down by ethnicity? And so we add race and ethnicity to our chart. And here's where we see the problem that we were having one group of students is more, has a higher number of registrants than the other group of students. So why could that be? And why is it so similar, but not quite the same? And then we'll also get into why do the totals line up with the individual row items? So my first suspicion when I started working on this problem was there must be something wonky about how the totals are calculating. So if I right click and I go to um, total using under default properties, I can see that the default here is automatic. I thought, oh, it must be picking the max for some reason I don't understand. And so I thought, well, why don't I change it to sum? Wouldn't that fix the problem? And so then I put registered on again with that new default behavior and I can see my totals are even squirrelier. 
but it didn't solve kind of the underlying problem. So that didn't seem like it either. So I'm going to switch back to using uh, automatic to be on the safe side. So what is going on here? What's happening? If I can duplicate one more time, we're going to start drilling into some more detail. So you remember how I said that this data set had multiple class sections in it. If I put sections onto the columns, we can see that I have sections 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And I'm going to remove that second register just to simplify what we're looking at here. What we can see now is that we get three students, uh, all with race and ethnicity of white in section one, and 79 students across all the race and ethnicity groups in section two, and the same story for section three, we have 28. So what this suggests is that there's something interesting about the pattern of this section, section one, as opposed to the other ones. So what's happening here, let me go to the pre-built one for this. So what's happening here is we're using a course the registered in the course indicator that's at the wrong level of aggregation. So remember in our data set, race and ethnicity lives only in the course enrollment data, which is our most granular data set available. But we were inadvertently using the field called registered from class section because that's what seemed reasonable to us at the time. And it was perfectly reasonable until we decided to drill further into the hierarchy and get into individual student level detail. So the solution to this problem is to use a, dif a different registered field. In this case, we wanted to use course enrollment, but let's go back to why does this happen? So why this happens is that uh, the, the white students are only enrolled in one particular section and there's three of them. And we can see in this column here, that three happens to match that three, but that's not particularly clear. So instead, let's look at section two, where we have 79 registrants. And for these ones, they're spread across all different uh, race and ethnicity groups that we have in our data. And so that 79 ends up getting replicated at the course section level, because remember at the section level, we don't have a way to split the course into different race and ethnicity groups. So our data is getting replicated, but as soon as we remove the section name information, it can start to become unclear. So going back to why is one of these groups 110 and the rest are 107, the answer to that is the 107 is these two combined and the 110 is all of them combined. And so Tableau is effectively replicating our data across these different race and ethnicity groups because we haven't given it enough data to actually perform the relationship that it needs to, to get into that level of detail. Conversely, an example like accounting uh, 269, I'll just go back to the, the top level here. Uh, we've got 161 people registered. And then when we add race and ethnicity, it replicates that 161 across all the different groups. And the reason why this one works is because A, there's only one section and B, every race and ethnicity group has registered in that only one section. So our totals from here, or sorry, from the fourth column uh, get replicated to every row that's in the class section level. So it kind of goes on like that. Some of them are a little bit more complicated. So the GSWS one is a similar example to the first one that we showed. Um, but, oh, it doesn't fit, okay. Um, but it gets a little bit more complicated when you have kind of a patchwork of which groups are enrolled in which sections of the course. And so what we see for physics 247, if we go back to kind of our, our second level here, we get differing totals across all the different groups. But in the end, the grand total matches the largest groups that are shown here. And the problem is replication. Okay, so kind of the quick way to spot this is to put the grand totals on for both rows and columns and say, does this make sense to me? And then the next question is, if it doesn't make sense to me, 
and I'm seeing lots of replication among groups, should I check to see if there's a more granular version of the same field? Okay, um, so moving on to the last example, and to give Christy approximately a five minute warning, um, We'll go through this. So I, I mentioned registered, there's a few different versions of it at different levels of aggregation. So we talked about course enrollment is individual student-based, course section is section-based, and student term is did you register or not. And sometimes it's helpful to have registered fields at both levels of granularity. The idea being that for performance reasons, you want to use course section whenever you can get away with it because you only have one row per course section that's offered rather than using the course enrollment details if you don't need them, which is one row per student per course section offered, um, which is slower in most environments. Um, so as mentioned, if we use a field that is too aggregate, then Tableau will replicate our totals across each row that's shown in our table, in this example, race and ethnicity. Uh, our second example here for dysfunctional relationships is sometimes values go missing. And this one is actually pretty similar to how joins behave when values go missing, but let's walk through together what this looks like. So in this example, we're gonna use primarily the student term related data. So I'm gonna, sorry, put down the right button. Um, I'm gonna start with a very, very simple count of how many students there are. Just so I have a sense of what I'm looking at, and that doesn't quite show. So we've got 15,881. And then I want to know who are these students. And so I'm going to pick the made up student number, and I'm going to do something similar to the previous example. So in this case, I'm going to put race and ethnicity on color. And that happened really fast. So let me go back a step and I'll direct your attention down here to the bottom left where it says we have 15,881 marks. Same story for rows. When I add race and ethnicity, I drop down to 14,661. So I lose 1,221 students. And I don't know why this happened. I wasn't expecting it. So what's ended up happening here is Tableau has assumed that we're using an inner join that I want the intersect between the student term table and the course enrollment data that has my ethnicity information on it. But in fact, what I wanted was a left join and the left join would have kept all the students regardless of whether they enrolled in a course, a byproduct of which is we have ethnicity data in this fake data set. So how do we fix that problem? I wanna get my 1200 students back. So there's a couple ways that we can do this. The simplest that I've found is to work with the count fields that are on the tables. So in this case, when we added race and ethnicity, which came from course enrollment, we lost about 1,200 students. So if we add the student term count uh, or any other measure as we see fit, we in turn go back up to 15,882 students, um, including my data warehousing uh, zero row, so kind of ignore that piece a little bit, but we can clean that up with a filter later on. Um, but in particular, what we've got here is we now have a null value on race and ethnicity that did not exist before. So if we keep only those, we can now see that we've got 1,221 students that we had previously lost through, um, through the work that we had done. The other way that we can come at this problem uh, similarly, Actually, in the interest of time, let me just show you that one. So the, the other way that we can do it is we can start with our count of student number, as we saw before. And then we can add the student number. Sorry. And then we can add the... student number from the more granular table. And what we see here is that from that granular table, course enrollment that has the ethnicity data on it, we've got a whole bunch of null 
student numbers, those 1,221, if we want to do it in a chart form. So these are a couple of ways you can dig into whether Tableau is missing values on you unintentionally. But if you just need the Coles notes, it's really helpful to search for the count fields from all the tables that you want to use and just throw those on to detail when you're making a list of students. If you don't have a measure from each of the tables that you really care about, my experience suggests Tableau is going to choose an inner join every time, regardless of the other settings that you put into place. Uh, though I'd love to hear from you if you found another way to force it to be a left join in an example like this. Okay, and wrapping up. So the example here was missing values. So our relationship tossed about 1,221 records. And the reason for that is it assumed we wanted an inner join when we put together our charts, adding the count field caused it to realize that actually we wanted a left join. You can put this onto detail like I did here, or you could put it onto rows or columns, et cetera. The result would be the same. Uh, with that, I will say thank you so much for having me. I have not been able to see the chat, so I'm open to questions uh, or also open to connecting digitally and we can engage in conversation that way. Thank you so much for having me. I remember back in the day that we only had that number of records way before relationships, it was just number of records for your entire data source. Um, I really enjoy the fact that we can now do this table by table um, with those counts. It's a nice, uh, nice feature add. <laughs> you and me both. It's more helpful than I had realized. Um, All right, I'm going to go ahead and share something. I'm hoping I'm sharing the right screen. Um, I didn't see any questions in the chat, um, but Andrew's contact information is in the chat and I will throw it in there one more time in just a second. Um, oh, okay, we're seeing some questions. Um, so after joining, how do you get rid of nulls that aren't needed in the filters? That's a really interesting question. Um, thank you, Annette, for that one. I can't say that I've found a perfect approach for that yet. Um, the the best way I've found is to make a calculated field that can identify them that the user doesn't see and filter them out. You may occasionally need to make it a context filter, but that is one of the tricky pieces. Um, the other one that seems to work fairly well is if you have a hierarchy built in, you can set the, uh, the filter to use only the values that are within the hierarchy, or alternately, you can show only relevant values once you've filtered something out, but that is one of the pieces I can't say I found a perfect workaround. And if anybody else has encountered the nulls and filters and knows how to get rid of them en masse, that would be wonderful to know. And we'd love that if, if you do have a solution there, if you could share it with us at a future HE tag meeting, always be selling. Uh, <laughs> so let us know um, at, uh, let's see, tinyurl.com slash present at HE tag. I think that link works. I hope that link works. So, great. If we have no more questions, we're going to go ahead and move on. Andrew, I think you're still on for intros. You're right. I am. Thank you, Roshni, for the reminder. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Christy Simpson. Um, and Christy is going to present present on using Tableau to create an interactive online fact book. Um, online fact books are a great way to provide transparent, regular communication with stakeholders on how an institution measures up to standards. And no matter where the stakeholders reside, but a lot of fake flat, <laughs> sorry, a lot of fact books are a bit flat and only a bird's eye view. So the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Nursing set out to create a flat report and make it more interactive for a variety of end users. The School of Nursing team used Tableau and Tableau Public to take a variety of data sources, put them into a multi-tab one-stop shop that contains something interesting for everyone to look at. Uh, Christy Simpson is a Texas native with a bachelor's degree in management and a master's degree in instructional design. Christy's worked for the TTUHSC School of Nursing since 2011, where she started administering student satisfaction surveys. Over the years, she's worked in both student affairs and academic programs to manage data regarding student performance, enrollment management, recruitment, and assessment. 
outside of, and presumably including satisfaction. Now she works in the office of outcomes management and evaluation. Since 2016, she's served as a head of both the TTUHSC uh, SON data governance and Tableau teams, working with data and creating dashboards to replicate standard reports for accreditation and institutional advancement. We'll throw Christy's uh, contact info into the chat. And with that, I will turn it over to Christy to talk about fact books. Thank you, Andrew. I didn't realize I was making you say a, a mouthful of things. <laughs> it's been a minute since that, I looked at what I wrote. That was actually my bad. The first section uh, I didn't need to read out loud. So that's you actually okay. gave me 50% and I doubled it. That's fine. Um, so yes, I'm Christy Simpson and I do work for the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center School of Nursing. Let me share my beautiful presentation here. There we go. That is my contact info, which also is in the, which apparently is being shared. So here we go. Of course, Murphy's Law is going to tell me. There we go. So to kind of give you an idea of who we are, um, a lot of what I'm talking about with our fact book, I really have to explain the why we did this, not so much as the how. Um, the TTU HSC uh, School of Nursing offers eight degree and certificate options with a variety of learning options within that. Uh, we have face-to-face -face and hybrid courses using eight different learning sites across the state of Texas. We also have fully online degree options. So our students, our faculty, and now since COVID, our staff are all over. Um, the Office of Outcomes Management and Evaluation where I'm working now is responsible for gathering data for just about everything. We mostly handle our regional and professional accreditation reports. Uh, we report things to the state board. We, we send data for grant proposals. We work with our institutional effectiveness group, which is, as of I think this month, is actually going to be our brand new institutional research uh, team. We just got a vice provost for institutional effectiveness. So yeah, we're going to be, School of Nursing is going to be working with me at the institutional level with him. And then anything else that we're asked for by faculty, staff, you name it, we pull it. <laughs> so that's kind of us in a nutshell. Um, with Tableau, we started using Tableau in 2016. I think it was around this same time of year. So we're celebrating our seventh year with Tableau. Um, it was really create, uh, acquired as a way to create a dashboard for reporting our satisfaction data. And it just sort of grew from there. Um, some of the things we started with within the Tableau team that was formed around the same time, because we do have our faculty and our our faculty and our stakeholders, some are located where we are here in Lubbock, Texas, and some are, I think at the time we had someone in Florida, but most of them are around the state. Uh, but we tried to use Tableau server. Unfortunately, we have about 200 faculty and roughly 200 staff, so that would be quite expensive to give everyone a license. We started using Tableau Reader for a time, found that that didn't work as well as we wanted it to because we were constantly having to make sure people updated Tableau Reader. So finally, we started using Tableau Public. That's our preferred method of sharing anything that's de-identified and aggregated. So we, we don't have to, we do everything in our power to make sure that no FERPA violations happen. Uh, we use an ETL program to mask all, any student IDs. There's no names. We do everything. We also make sure that if it's on Tableau Public, it can't be downloaded data-wise. So that's where we are in a nutshell. That was up to 2019 and 2020, right around the same time that everything shut down. Um, our administration decided they wanted to create an online fact book as a replacement for a static report that our dean would throw out every year, um, really as a way to share with external and internal stakeholders is needed. Um, our original, our institutional fact book is very, it's all, it's a collection of PDFs at this point. I'm hoping that it will become interactive, um, but it's also for, it also just would combine the schools as a whole well, with as many degree plans and options as we have, it wasn't serving us. And even the flat report that our dean had wasn't serving us. So we put in, they wanted student data, 
So our standard enrollment, graduation, admissions, et cetera, our certification results, things about our faculty, our alumni, and then just the organization as a whole, as far as within the school of nursing, like things like funding. How do we put that all in one report that isn't a small novel? Um, as the Tableau team started going through the various elements, some of what we looked at was what are the items we could keep static and what were the things that really needed that extra granularity? Um, the other request we received is they wanted a longitudinal, a way to look at things longitudinally um, because our institutional fact book is just that snapshot in time based on the year, the time of year that people send in their data. So they wanted something that could be updated a little bit faster. So enter Tableau, um, we had to pull in a variety of data sources. Some of our things are extracts from our student information system. Uh, we also have personal spreadsheets. Uh, prior to getting a CRM for our admissions data, it, people kept application data in a spreadsheet. That's our data governance nightmare. <laughs> and then we also have things on PDF. Uh, some of our items have been just, here's, here are my publications via PDF. So variety of data. Um, again, a uh, variety of timeframes. There are a lot of things that are longitudinal. And then we also had to look at what are some things that we really don't need to keep a five-year record of? Uh, or what, what do we not need to keep a five-year record of to keep it from being very clunky and ugly? Um, we've used a variety of vises and items, such as graphs. Uh, parameters, which is my favorite thing to work with, text boxes, and then links to external sites, again, just to keep it a little cleaner. Um, and as a team, as we learn more, we want to incorporate new things to the dashboard. Um, my new thing to try is dynamic zone visibility. I saw it at the Tableau conference, and I'm trying to figure out a way to incorporate it into this lovely dashboard or any dashboard that I have. So that's where we are. And so that's all of us in a nutshell. The how we did it was we just pulled everything together very, very quickly. <laughs> I think we got the assignment in June and we had to have something together in November amidst every other report that was due that year because all of our reports are due September, October, November, December. So here we are. Let me actually show the lovely dashboard. And this is our dashboard, um, which if I would resume my share, please tell me you can see a beautiful dashboard. We can see it. Yay. So we started off very, everything in here seems very basic with bar charts and a few text things. We have, I, my team and I, we try to design for our end users and the data literacy and tech savvy range of our end users. We have some that are, they understand anything we give them. And then there are some that need a little bit more. It's just trying to design for that big group. But here's our first thing, our application data for one of our programs. As you can see, we have tons of concentrations. These are things we're asked for, my team is asked for all the time is what, how many complete applications did we have? What have met the requirements? What are the offers? How many accepted? So giving this data, the idea behind this was not only for my reporting, the reporting we do at the end of the year, but I've had, you know, if the department chair says, hey, I need to know what our applications look like, bam, here you go. They can print this, present it in a slide. We send them this link. They do pretty well with it. Um, then we move through to enrollment. Again, it's just what does it look like on that five-year scale based on whatever parameters they need to look at. And then, as I mentioned, we have quite a few learning sites for our undergrads. They can look at it by site. And we give them that gender breakdown and that ethnicity breakdown. So anything they can look at. The interaction part is, it's really, instead of us looking at a crystal ball saying, okay, what do they want? We give them just about everything we can think of. 
and add more later on. I try to look at something that's and these are our lovely certification pass rates um, or for our registered nurses. That's a huge metric with the state is how well do they pass the first time. Uh, they get one shot. If, they, if this number, this percentage goes too low, then the state comes in and yells at us and we have to do some work. So it's a way of saying, okay, what did you wanna know? How did it change? And these again are, Metrics that were asked for sometimes monthly, depending on the time of year, we can throw this in. The great thing about having an interactive dashboard is we don't get these results in November when we're supposed to have this finished. We don't get them usually till February. This way we're never behind. We can just update it as needed. What was happening with the flat fact book is we had to say, okay, when are we getting those results? Does it coincide with when the institution says we need to have them? Essentially, we were almost always a year behind in what we reported. Um, but this is where I use our lovely parameters is, do you wanna know first time or if you're ever curious about overall? So we let our faculty choose how they need to, our department chairs, our dean, whenever he's looking through this can easily see it. And then it's interactive to update by year. Of course it's not working. I need to fix it before November. Oh, oh, there we go. And there's a lot of tabs up here. I know that eventually we are gonna look at creating arrows. So it's a little more like a web page navigation for our users. And let's see. And so we look at things like our faculty and our staff giving everybody that idea of, well, what's going on each year? How many, what do our awards look like? Um, and then our external websites are things like, if our staff are in publications or if our faculty are in publications, if our students are in pu publications, it's a great way to get a ton of data in one place for anyone who may need it. So, I know that since I originally came up with this idea of talking about this, I have seen other schools with interactive fact books. I believe UT San Antonio has one as well that's much more interesting, is much different from ours. And I wanna utilize some of their options as well. So that is all I have. <laughs> this was a labor of love and it will constantly change. I highly recommend you know, connecting on social, you know, connecting on LinkedIn. Um, I put our webpage, our main webpage for the universe, for our Tableau team. Uh, we complete quite a few things over the, over the years. We definitely do have our student satisfaction assessments on there. You can see how we pulled in uh, surveys with roughly 5,000 responses per semester and put them into something that's usable. And with that, are there any questions, comments, caustic remarks? Um, we had one question from me, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, have you thought about, so you're talking about the navigation because now you have like, you know, a gajillion tabs. Have you thought about using stories for the navigation? Um, we haven't. I think we had, we tried stories way back in 2016. <laughs> I've yep. not messed with them since. <laughs> that that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. I, I remember playing with stories, but I do know that they've made a few changes um, mm -hmm. or some improvements to how stories work. I don't know if that would help or if, you know, building out the, the navigation is the, um, is, is the better option, um, but it's something to keep in mind. Yeah. So. Um, you do what? have, there is, there's someone did like the, uh, the line chart with the circular marks and data. Um, it was the one before the one that had the 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 plus and the the heart the um the heart rate <laughs> ones. And that that's actually yeah, it was our, our attempt at a line series. It came out of for our um in our student satisfaction assessments. We somebody wanted a line series, so we started doing that chart for that. I just like the way it looks. <laughs> so that can't think of anything else. 
Cool. It looks like there's a, someone else just shared uh, an enrollment um, fact book as well. So um, share. We have we have a Slack space if folks want to put some of their um, their fact books up there um, so we can sort of learn from each other. Um, feel free to throw them in there uh, in in our in our Slack space or here in the chat. Um, but thank you, Christy. That was this was really great. It was well worth the wait uh, from <laughs> December. <laughs> Uh, uh, December. It's the time. time. <laughs> I know exactly. Um, it's kind of it's kind of fitting, you know. School and nursing, being sick, like it all, it all kind of works. Um, mm -hmm. But thank you, thank you uh, again for presenting. Um, that was really cool. Yeah. So we're gonna close out today. Um, as always, we have some links for you. So please let us know what you thought of today's meeting. There's a link on the screen and in the, uh, the chat. You can also use your phone to get the QR code. Um, we do have a page up for our next meeting, which is on August 15th. Um, we are still looking for someone to do a tips and tricks. It can be, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Um, if you have something to share, whether it's about something like dynamic zone visibility, hiding those nulls, whatever, let us know um, by going to tinyurl.com slash present at HETUG. Um, see, I, I, I got it right this time. Um, and if you want to present, whether in August or in the future at any point, um, feel free to let us know by going to the form that is there. Um, again, if you go to our user groups page, um, you will be able to see all of the events that we have scheduled for the rest of the year. You can register. Um, we haven't filled in all the details, um, but the, the meetings are there so you can at least get them onto your calendar. Um, so that is all for today. Thank you to our speakers, to Christy and to Andrew, and to all of you for participating in our epic lightning round Kahoot. Um, it's been a great two years and we're looking forward to many, many more. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone.